G'day and welcome to Snap Happy, the photography show. I'm Jason Edwards. And I'm Maddie Claire Sloan. Jace, where are you off to this week? Well, Mads, I had the opportunity to photograph the Uluru Camel Cup and it was amazing. There was so much fun and so many things to photograph. What about you? Well, I catch up with documentary photographer Michael Coyne about his recent trip to Borneo where he took this amazing photograph. Fantastic. All this and more on today's episode of Snap Happy, the photography show. Michael Coyne is a documentary photographer and photojournalist. He has been published in magazines such as Newsweek, Life, Time and National Geographic, just to name a few. He's been presented with numerous accolades and was even awarded the Centenary Medal by the Australian Government for his service to photography. Tell us about your career. Where did it all start? Where did it all start? It started in, in Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> and then I had my first assignment up in New Guinea for Time magazine and from the Islamic Revolution in the Southern Philippines, I ended up at the Islamic Revolution in Iran. Sounds amazing. Now, obviously you do a lot of things overseas. Tell us about your latest adventure. Uh, my latest thing is I've been working on a book about village life around the world. People are losing culture, customs, and all of their way of life. And so I'm trying to document those things before they all disappear. Let's take a look at Michael's recent assignment in Borneo. Photography is about reflection. It's not about recording. It's about showing what's going on. It's about telling people and bringing the viewer into the situation, taking them there. How amazing, huh? Very nice. Oh, very nice. It's also about narrative. It's about telling a story about inviting the viewer into the story that you're telling. Village life is changing. It's not the same as it was. People are leaving villages because of globalization, global warming and agricultural changes. People are leaving the villages and they're disappearing. And for the first time in history, more people now live in the city than they do in the countryside. And when that happens, there's less people working in the agricultural area, less people producing our food, and less people looking after the land. I've been doing this project now for over 10 years. It takes a long time to organize, set up, and shoot these images and to get to the villages. Basically, villages are the same. It's a group of people living together, sharing a community and sharing a language, sharing customs and sharing a culture. It's important to record what is happening in this way of life because for the first time, it's changing so much that it will disappear and we will lose that whole way of life and humanity. People have to leave their villages to earn a living and they send the money back sometimes or they don't come back at all. And then in some villages I've visited, there've just been old people living there because the young have gone because there's no opportunity for them in those places. And I've been trying to document all of these changes and showing it in many ways, and in many ways it affects villages. I've photographed people who are farmers who are struggling, people who have been forced out of villages, people who are being forced into villages and showing what happens when the community is still there and working together, or when the community disintegrates. I've seen how a community keeps itself together by living together and sharing with one another. It's like a giant family. Three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> in the morning, I'm It's no really important no good in doing the sort of work that I do to be able to connect with people to actually like people, which I do. I love working with people. Okay. I can't speak many languages, and those that I can speak, oh, I can only speak so a few words or phrases. Absolutely beautiful. You yeah, might not understand their culture, you might not agree with what they're doing, but to like them and connect with them is terribly important when doing this work. With all the travel that I do and the places I go and the different cultures I see, I like to take a minimum amount of equipment. 
and I find that working with a small camera body and an f2 23mm lens suits me perfectly. It's light, it's easy to work with and I know I'm going to get the quality that I need. It's just the sort of lens that I can work with people and photographing people is what my job is about. I don't know how long this will take me, but I think it's important enough to continue the project, to spend the time with the people, to actually end up with a documentation of a part of history that is disappearing slowly. The Heart Project is all about helping people through challenges using photography and compositing to do that. We have a group, a team of compositors, photographers that create imagery for people to free them from their restrictions, free them from their challenges. They might be kids that can't walk, that can't speak, they might be adults that are quadriplegics, but it's really about bringing hope and joy to people through photography. We had a retreat, uh, it was called the Refocus Retreat, and at this retreat we did a live heart project shoot with a couple of girls that have been sick. Thankfully they're, they're well now. They, they're journeying through having leukaemia. We created a book for them which tells of their story and their journey, but they journey into a magical fantasy land, and this fantasy land helps them to realise that Doctors and nurses and the hospital are there to help them and not to be scared. So the idea of this book is to actually help people and children all around the world if they have to face the same thing. And each of the team members is creating a page each, so it really is a collaborative effort. It's really important uh, to me to photograph with the Wacom tablet, uh, my mobile studio pro and tether to it so that when I'm photographing, we can actually test all of the photos out and make sure they fit. I could not do what I do without a tablet, without a pen, um, you know, with a mouse. There's such fine detail that goes into it. So many layers, so much editing, cutting out around uh, a subject and, you know, making sure that they look like they're in the scene. So I love this tablet because I can actually go anywhere with it. I sit in cafes, I sit in bed with it, in planes. The kind of work that I do, I know there are people that try and do it with a mouse and they struggle. When you're working so finely for such a long period of time, you can get a very sore hand with a mouse. You know, can you use it for a long period of time and not get tired? So for this front page image, uh, the tree with the heart, I wanted the girls to really look like they're sitting in the tree. And after we photo them sitting in the seat in the right angle. I've put them in. I've used some controls like puppet warp so I can bend them in the direction that I want. Really, really cool feature. But just adding light and shade and shadow and making it look like they're embedded into the scene. So painting all of that in. You can't just cut someone out and stick them in. It just doesn't look right. So there, there is a lot that goes into this kind of work. And so I've just worked through all of those steps to create that magical looking light and make them look like they're asleep in the tree and it's really very cute. <laughs> Every time I present the finished image to that family, just the joy on their faces and the amazement, it just makes it all worthwhile and you know you realise that photography can actually make a difference. Hi, I'm Michael Coyne and this is what's in my kit. I always travel with a Fuji X-Pro2 and a 23mm lens. When I'm working, I like to work as light as possible, as little amount of camera gear as possible. So the still photography that I do is always shot on this camera with one lens. Now when I'm shooting video projects, I shoot with the X-T2 with a 18 to 55 mil lens. Again, it's small, but the lenses are sharp, the bodies are easy to work with and quick. And with this camera, you get 4K if you want to shoot 4K, and it's fabulous reproduction. Very good stuff. Now, the other thing I always have in my bag is this Brook Farm bar, because if I'm out all day, I've got to eat something. So I have that there, just in case I get stuck out while I'm working. And I have a towel. Usually I have the towel around my neck. I have the towel around my neck to make sure perspiration doesn't get on my camera. Then I take the towel. I fold the towel over, put it down carefully, 
balance the camera on the tail, and then I have a tripod. And when I'm shooting video, the video is still, because one of the important things for shooting video is keep the camera very still. I'm Michael Coyne, and that's what's in my kit. So I've just shot the Batala, a temple in Lhasa, Tibet. It's one of the most sacred sites here, and I turned up to shoot the dawn. Unfortunately, I completely and utterly underestimated the Chinese photo tour. And although I was here early, there was about 150 people here earlier than me. So it was my first experience of a Chinese media scrum, of which it's very, very difficult to compete with. So my advice to you, if you ever get here, is to get here really early. Like if someone tells you to get here at seven o'clock, you get here at five o'clock if you want a great position. I still got a few frames, but you know, not what I'd hope with a time lapse. Now the Melbourne Cup is one of the greatest horse races in the world, famous for its glitz and glamour, huge crowds and amazing fashion. Now I'm here at the Uluru Camel Cup in Central Australia and as you can see it's a little bit different. People are still frocking up and there's lots of crowds building and there's going to be camels running through this Central Australian red sand. I'm super excited about it because the sun's out and we're going to get some great footage. About six, six and a half years ago, I was looking for something to bring the community together, something that was fun, action, and also to put this place on the map. The crowd is amazing. There's lots of people, lots of colour, so many things happening. What can we expect to see here? Well, it's only going to get bigger and better as the day goes. We start the day with qualifying heats. Camels have to qualify to get into the cup. And there's a bit of money floating around because last night we had the cow cutter down at the local hotel, and that's where we auctioned off all the camels, and 20,650 is in the kitty. So the winning camel today has got a chance of picking up over $10,000 to take home. There's games here for the kids there, there's fashions of the field, there's joy flights with the helicopters, and uh, the highlight is the way we finish off during the night. We finish about two o'clock in the morning with the Outback Frock Up and Rock Up Ball. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Mickey, mate, you rode Abdul, one of the favourites in the Uluru Camel Cup today. How did that go for you? Oh, exciting. I've been waiting since last year to, to race these guys. Uh, a couple of new wild, uh, wild cards there, and uh, they're um, brand new to the races, but they're, they're just as fun to, to ride um, than all the other camels, actually. Yeah. What's it like riding on top of a camel? I mean, they're enormous animals, much bigger than horses. Yeah, so. it's much taller than a horse, yeah. uh, so you've got longer to, longer to fall if, uh, if you come <laughs> off one of them. Um, I just love that uh, adrenaline rush, really, uh, excitement. It's not about winning or losing, it's about uh, having fun out yeah. here. Yeah, yeah and, that's good. And enjoying it. So the first race happened and we almost missed the action. Everything happened just so fast. I'm in position a little bit earlier this time and I'm going to shoot the start of the race. Now that means I want to have a really fast shutter speed. Now you can see the lights up, it's pretty glary. So I'm also using a flash and I'm going to pop a little bit of film flash into the scene as the camels run past. So I missed it again, absolutely missed it again. I was getting ready, checking my settings, bang and it was all off. Um, <laughs> thank God there's more races. So we've just shot race three, the start, our third attempt. Get there early, get ready, pay attention, don't chat, don't check your settings, have all that done, then maybe you'll get a shot. We've just had the uh, fashions in the field, fashion parade at the Uluru Camel Cup. It's uh, not your normal fashion in the field event, as you can imagine, surrounded by dust, but still plenty of beautiful ladies, elegantly dressed amongst the red centered dirt. With the sun, I had to use some fill flash to pop some light into that scene. But uh, yeah, there's a couple of fun shots. So the suspense is building for the men's fashion in the field. The shake's looking pretty good. But there is some dapper, some dapper outfits here. So the judge's decision is in, and the gentleman with the crocodile skin boots has taken out top honours. Congratulations to all the competitors. But damn tough shooting against that sun. So 
Now I've managed to get a couple of frames of facade. Interestingly, I almost had to silhouette the camels to get what I was looking for. Now what I'm after is some backlit shots where the sun's behind the camels so that I can see the dust kicking up from their hooves as they come around these bends in the sand. The time has come for the main event, the Uluru Camel Cup. Anticipation mounts and the police are in position to clock the speed of the winning camel. I've positioned myself just behind the finish line to capture the final action of the day. Oh, it was fun coming second, but uh, you know, it's uh, not about the what you come, it's um, how you end the race, really. The crowd was wild there, cheering you guys on. Yeah, you could hear them as you're going <laughs> past them on the, on the camels. Yeah. First woman to win the Uluru Camel Cup. First woman, yeah. yeah. So I've uh, you know, set that record today. And did you uh, enjoy your ride? The nerves kick in when you get into that race and the camels start kicking around a little bit and it just, you know, stomach comes up and then once the camel starts running, it's just everything's completely gone and you just go. Well, congratulations. Thank you. If you're looking for a unique outback experience, the Uluru Camel Cup is perfect. It's a fantastic day out with so much colour and fun and great community spirit. There's so many photographic opportunities. Can't tell you how many shots I've taken today. Happy shooting. So Michael, your trip looked amazing, so inspiring. Now, on the show, we like to ask our guests some tips they can give us to improve our photography. What do you have for us? Okay, now the first tip I have is always step forward. Okay. Professionals step forward, amateurs step back. And when the amateur steps back, they have too much space around their subject. Now, the reason that professionals step forward is they like to fill the frame. They like to create the image in their camera. Beautiful. So number one, step forward. What's yes. number two? Number two is content, composition and lighting. Composition is about how you line up the image. Content is the subject that you're photographing and light creates the shade and form and shape of the image. So never forget lighting. Lighting is one that amateurs often forget. And number three? Respect people and their culture. Because if you respect people, they will respect you. Doesn't matter where you go, but always remember the best way to be able to photograph people is respect them. Beautiful. Thanks for being on the show, Michael. My pleasure. <laughs> and I forgot to tell you, I only take one spare of underwear, so I have to clean them every day. <laughs> Putting together a photographic portfolio can be a daunting task, but it's really worth the effort. To see a series of your images in print is really rewarding, and it's a great way to share your work with friends, family, or potential clients. So the theme of my project today has been about a trip I did to Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is one of those places that still has yet to be explored and developed. So the theme I'm looking for is discovery and colour and shape and form. Now finding a subjective or objective third party to have a look at your work is a really useful tool for narrowing down the frames. So I will use anyone that comes into the office or if I'm at home I'll use family members or friends who might be here and try and get their opinion on what they think works best to tell a story. We're all incredibly emotionally connected to the images we take. I'm no different to you, I have a hard time narrowing down the pictures. So when I do my edit, I look at them at full screen as large as I can and I tap through one picture to the next. I mark the ones I like initially green by hitting number eight in Lightroom. Then for my next round of edit, I cull them down and I go to number six, which is red. And then my final selects, which are exported, are blue, which is number nine. And that gives me my tightest edit for the pictures that I like to use in my book project. So I've completed my edit for Papua New Guinea and I've made my selects for the book. And I'm going to process them now using Adobe Lightroom on this highly calibrated monitor here in my office. So for my cover, I've picked an image of a young Asmat warrior. I was very privileged to meet these people and spend time with them and their costumes and headdresses were magnificent. So what I'm going to do is make sure that I don't lose any of that rich detail in his skin tones and also in the feathers. So I'm going to do that by checking where my black and white points are. So that means where do my shadows begin and where do my highlights begin so that I don't lose any of the detail. This is really important to learn how to do it. And then I'm going to look and see if there's any color shift. 
I don't want the image to be too warm, to have too much yellow in it. But at the same point in time, I want to make sure that in particular, the bird's feathers are accurate. Now that I've selected the images and processed them, the next step is to design the layout of my book. In the next episode, I will take you through the process using the Snapfish website. It's a lot of fun and it's really quite easy to do as well. Until then, happy shooting. Well, Jay's Papua New Guinea looked amazing. It was, Mads, and it was an absolute privilege to photograph that culture. And the portfolio is going to look incredible. I can't wait to see. Where to next? Well, I head up to the Daintree Rainforest in far north Queensland, where I put the Lumix GH5 through its paces. If you want to join the Snap Happy community, head on over to our website at snaphappytv.com for exclusive content, competitions and offers from our partners. See you next time on Snap Happy, the photography show. I mean, look at the weather, it's absolutely fantastic. The crowds are starting to build. You know, the announcements are coming through constantly. If you're looking for a unique outback experience, the Uluru Camel Cup is fantastic. Have you got me? Um, he's eating a camera. <laughs>